Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Abdullah. Um, I work for Google. And I'm going to present uh, our work on JobSet API, um, specifically uh, for on-demand systems, uh, HPC systems, and scale training. This is a presentation that I prepared with uh, Vanessa um, Sokat from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Unfortunately, she was not able to attend today, um, but she has a recording. So this presentation is going to be um, two parts. I'm going to present the first part, and I will play a recording for the, for the second part. Um, so for a while, we've been talking about Kubernetes as not being too advocate for batch workloads. But I'm going to start by saying Kubernetes is advocate for batch workloads. We've been working for a while on uh, improving uh, Kubernetes um, to support batch workloads. Uh, as you've seen the past uh, few Kubernetes, a few KubeCon talks, um, mainly through the job API. Um, so we've been working on improving it to support uh, various cases of batch workloads, including training and HPC and whatnot. Um, the main feature that we've added in the job API was index job. Um, and in addition to that, we have new features related to how you decide when, um, like pod failure policies, uh, also the ability to set up um, a stable network um, IDs um, um, for pods that are created through index job, which all are requirements um, if you've ever worked with MPI or um, you know, distributed um, training. Even though that I claim that uh, Kubernetes now is a home for batch, I think we can still do better. Um, so there's always, there's always a but. Um, and so we've been working on a new API uh, in a sub-project under Kubernetes called JobSet. Um, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a new API. The idea behind it is that it manages a group of jobs as a single workload. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're trying to basically reuse the core Kubernetes uh, job API to try to expand its use cases. Um, as you can see on the graphic on the, um, uh, on the right side, with job set, you are able to create or specify multiple job templates. And for each template, you can specify how many jobs or replicas of that template I want. And it also allows you to automate, um, set up like, you know, success and failure policies for this new uh, workload that is represented as a collection of jobs. And so in, a, in general, what it tries to do is really automate uh, multiple uh, patterns that we've discovered in uh, training and HBC type workloads. As I mentioned, multi-template jobs, uh, setting up part to part communication. Um, with index job, you used to create an index job, and then you create a headless service yourself um, and set up everything. And then when you clean them up, you have to do it manually. Uh, with jobs, we're trying to automate these, uh, these things. As I mentioned also, we are uh, trying to provide some common failure and success policies. Like, when do we consider the whole workload as failed? Um, so, in some cases, for example, you have this like leader follower pattern. Uh, if the, one of the followers fails, you don't necessarily need to fail the whole workload. But if the leader fails, you want to say, OK, yeah, fail the whole workload. Same thing with success. When do we consider the whole workloads as successful? If we are managing a, uh, you know, a, group of, uh, a group of jobs, which job, when it succeeds, should we consider the whole job, uh, the whole workload as successful? Or should we say all the child jobs should succeed to consider the workload as successful? Um, also, it tries to provide some uh, knobs to decide how to place these jobs. In some cases, with uh, distributed training, you try to place the jobs on different parts of your um, you know, infrastructure. Consider, like for example, you have different tracks, and so each job represents um, you know, uh, uh, a shard of the, of the training workload, and you want to have really high bandwidth communication between uh, the pods that are responsible for these shards. And so you want to create a job for each rack, and you want to ensure that each job lands on a different rack. Um, so I'm going to talk about two use cases that we use job set for. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is a scale distributed training on TPUs. And uh, Vanessa is going to talk about the second one, which is um, uh, the HPC use case. Um, so what is a TPU? This is the, the only uh, uh, pitch for TPUs. It's, it's Google's. Uh, basically, accelerator we designed for 
um, machine, uh, specifically for machine learning. Um, it is, it works with like most uh, frameworks um, uh, supporting PyTorch, JAX, TensorFlow, and integrates well with Kubernetes. Um, there are two main form factors for TPUs. One is the, what we call like the TPU device, where you have like a single VM uh, attached to uh, a TPU device. There is no special network communication with other devices in the, in the cluster. Uh, usually is designed for inference uh, type workloads. Um, but that's not our focus for this talk. Our focus is on uh, the other form factor, which is TPU slices, where when you provision, you actually provision a group of VMs as a unit, and those VMs, they are the, the device, TPU devices on those VMs, they are connected with special uh, high-speed interconnect links. Like they are pretty much like fiber links that are like point to point between these devices. And it is specifically designed for, for, for training, distributed training workloads. Uh, and those slices, they can be provisioned in different shapes. So here I'm showing like a, a, two, by, uh, a two by two, but it can be all the way up to like 64 VMs in a single, or not in a single, single slice. So how do we train workloads on, on, sli on, on pods, uh, on, on uh, TPU slices? The training setup is really simple from Kubernetes perspective. So you need a, to have a pod pair node. That pod basically consumes all the TPU device on each node. And each pod needs a unique ID. We need to set up uh, stable network IDs between the pods uh, so that the lower level communication library, it's called libtpu, but it's pretty much similar to uh, you know, MPI, um, and, and it requires those, you know, stable IDs to be set up so that it can, it can, it can do the distributed uh, communication. Um, and for failure, basically, it's like, again, any, any distributed training uh, framework, if any pod fails, we need to restart the whole thing. So how do we do this with, uh, with Kubernetes? Well, easy. Just use index drop. Like, I just described how index drop work. So you specify like uh, the number of workers in the parallelism or completions um, and completions um, parameter. Uh, you set a back of limit to zero. Basically, if any pod fails, just fail the whole job because we can't. Even if that pod was recreated, um, it's not going to be able to continue to 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 train. Um, and then we manually create the service and we we set up the subdomain so that the ID, the pods get uh, stable IDs and we set up some environment variables. Um, for the, uh, you know, training framework, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, to work. Now, the issue is, now we're talking about LLMs with, like, you know, significantly larger. No single, even TPU slice can train uh, the, the type of LLMs that we're trying to, uh, to, uh, to train. And so we're looking now at multi-slice training. Uh, and so the training is shared between multiple slices, and we have two levels of orchestration. Uh, there is orchestration within the same slice, which I just described. It's the same. But then there is also coordination between multiple slices. Um, the failure policy is similar. So basically, if any pod in any slice fail, it's not enough to just recreate that pod. Everybody else needs to restart. So how do we do this? Well. Easy, just create this massive YAML file with a, an index job for every single slice that um, you have, set up some environment variables to make it work. But this is hard to manage, right? What if my training workload spans hundreds of slices? And how do I monitor the status of the whole job, right? Like now you have 100 or 200 index jobs. There is no one place to look for the status of the whole workload. And how do I manage failures as well? Like, how do I fail all the other jobs if one job fail? With index job, if you had one index job, we had that supported by index job, right? Like, if one pod fails, I can set back of limit to zero, and then the job controller will say, okay, that job is failed. But now I need to do that for all other jobs as well. And last but not least, like, how do I ensure that each job land exclusively on a slice? Um, and this is where job set helps us. So this is an example workload that we we ran on, on GKE at this scale. We had uh, uh, over 12,000 nodes, 50, over 50,000 TPU chips. We had uh, almost 200 TPU slices, basically 200 index jobs that we had to create. And for each index job, is 64 pods. And we managed it using um, job set. Uh, and, and also, we had queue installed in the cluster uh, because we had other smaller jobs running 
that we needed to manage uh, uh, the resources using. So how did we do that with, with Jobset? Well, as I mentioned, with Jobset allows us to create a number of replicated jobs. For, for the use case that I'm describing here, we didn't really need to create different jobs of different templates. That's the second use case that Venice is going to talk about. For our use case here, it was mostly about creating multiple index jobs from the same table. They are replicas. So here um, in the, like, uh, round, in the uh, blue box, you can see we have the template here, which is really an index job. It's a, it's a job template. You specify the same thing that you specified before. Um, and, and in this parameter, number of replicas is basically uh, specifies how many index jobs needs to be created. And in the success policy, um, we, you could specify uh, basically that the whole workload is successful only if all the jobs are successful and finished successfully. With restart, with, with failure policy, um, Right now, we have only one type, which is if anybody fails, the whole job fails, but you, you can specify how many times you want to restart it. So this also gives you an automated way to restart the job, uh, the whole workload, basically, when this happens. And the way that it does is basically it recreates all the jobs if a failure happens, so to force, basically, a restart. Um, and then there are a bunch of uh, you know, uh, environment variables that uh, you can set up. We, with Jobset, you get um, a, a number of uh, labels and annotations injected into each job that gets created, like the index of the each job and whatnot, that makes it fairly easy and very straightforward uh, to map it to um, uh, the lower level frameworks as environment variables. Um, one last thing here is still under development, which why we only have it as an annotation, uh, we need to migrate it to a proper API is exclusive placement. So with this, what we're saying is that each job that you create, that jobs it creates, should ensure that it, it lands on a unique set of nodes with a shared uh, TPU slice ID. So here on the right side, you can see that each TPU slice has a bunch of VMs. They will get a, a shared TPU slice ID, like a managed group, for example. They have, it's, for example, this is TPU slice ID 0, 1, and 2. Uh, with jobs, say, we, we, while specifying this parameter, it's going to ensure that each job that you create, for example, job zero, its pods will land only on one slice, and only job zero will land on one slice. It will repel all other jobs. And so I find this a bit interesting, maybe to, dig, to deep dive a bit on, into it, how we implemented this. So we implemented it using really just like pod affinity and anti-affinity. We didn't really integrate a new scheduler into the job set operator. Uh, what we did was injecting um, two scheduling constraints, a pod affinity constraint that basically ensures that all the pods of a job land on the same slice. But that's not enough, right? Like, I want to make sure that no other, no other pod land on the same slice as well and avoid these, like, you know, types of race conditions. And so we had to insert as well an anti-affinity constraint to, make, to, to say all other pod, like uh, uh, any pod from any other job cannot land on the same slice. And so this is like this combination of, of pod affinity and affinity um, allows us to implement this exclusive um, placement. So our plan here is to really, uh, um, you know, um, enhance this API, make transition it to a proper API into the spec, but we also want to include other um, um, you know, uh, semantics. So this, the exclusive placement is the thing that we needed at first, but I can see other types, right? Like for example, a job should land on the same slice or maybe think about it rack, but it's not necessarily in an exclusive way, right? Like you could fit multiple jobs under the same rack. Uh, or you could, in, in this case, it's a required, right? Like it's, it's a hard uh, requirement. We can also allow it to specify, for example, it's preferred, right? Like so that uh, for performance reasons, we prefer that the pods of a job land on the same um, topology, but that's not a requirement. Uh, so we can continue to make progress if that doesn't exist. Um, so that concludes the first part of the talk. The second part, I'm going to play um, Vanessa's uh, presentation for 
um, the HPC use case. Hey, KubeCon. I'm Vanessa Sockett. I'm a computer scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And today I'm going to be talking to you about application building in Kubernetes using JobSet. So about a year ago, I started my adventure as a developer for Kubernetes. And specifically, I had one goal to implement a job manager, our job manager at the lab called Flux Framework inside of Kubernetes. And so I wanted to take Flux and I wanted to take Kubernetes and I wanted to switch them together because that's how software engineering works, right? Not exactly. So there's these two communities. We have cloud and HPC. And in between them is this beautiful opportunity for the convergence of technologies and culture. We call this converged computing. And there was some rhyme to our reason in choosing Kubernetes and Flux. Both of our communities use them for running workloads and jobs, and they're also both modular. So for example, I can take a component from Flux and I can implement it inside of Kubernetes and vice versa. So TLDR, long story short, we created the Flux operator to implement the entirety of Flux in fr framework inside of Kubernetes. And it was an awesome experience. It was the first taste of convergence. So our next logical question was, okay, we have our workload manager. Now, how do we run applications? Let's go and talk to some fish in that bay. How are these cloud and HPC apps actually different? First, looking at application coupling. In cloud, we have very loosely coupled apps. In HPC, we have very tightly coupled apps. And we'll talk more about what that means later in the talk. For resource scheduling in cloud, we may want to run a pod with a certain amount of CPU. In HPC, we're actually scheduling more than software, we're scheduling hardware down to the PCI bus. For job queuing in cloud, we may do something like calculate a priority score. In HPC, we have very sophisticated queuing algorithms that often are graph-based. Finally, workflow management. Well, cloud does this really well with automated declarative management. Bring in the YAML camel. In HPC, we also have workflow tools, but sometimes it's not really great. It's like bash scripts all the way down. <laughs> so our first step after obviously getting our workload manager in Kubernetes was like, let's run some applications. Let's get into our bathing suits, dive into that bay. Whee! And our applications, they, they didn't run. Oh, why doesn't it work? The question for developers of all time, please someone tell me why doesn't it work? So we needed to actually look deeper into this mystery. We needed to dive into the trench of treachery. Wait, how, how did that get there? I mean, the trench of discovery <laughs> to really debug this problem. And so my team and I, we loaded up in our submarine, except I was the one on the outside that like in the movie gets eaten by the shark or like the underwater sea monster. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. So we went down, down, down. And our first stop was to try to better understand how we could model our complex HPC applications in Kubernetes. And we already had some experience with this because of the Flux operator we had used an index job. So we had taken Flux, put it in a container, the containers go in pods, and by way of the index job, that gives us duplicates. We can add some system configuration files, and then a headless service gives us unique host names so they can all talk to one another. And this encompassed the Flux mini cluster was awesome, but there were hashtag developer problems. There's always developer problems, aren't they? So the first one was that we have to have different entry point logic based on the index in one script. We also needed to manually create the headless service. And finally, we really needed a way to say like, when this main index zero is done, the entire job is done. So, okay, we understood the limitations of job. We kept going in our adventure and we encountered job set. Hey, job set, what's going on? What are you doing under the ocean? You know what? Don't answer that. It's, it's totally cool. I do not judge. Yes, we would absolutely love your help. So with job set, we could add this other abstraction of a job set. And by way of having more than one replicated job, we could separate the logic of our different components, specifically into a lead broker and follower brokers. We could still be have them on the same network. And with a success policy, we could actually say, okay, when this lead broker is done, the entire job is done. Awesome. So we knew that job set would be this abstraction to allow us to build these complex HPC applications. 
But we still we still have this problem, which is why we're underwater in the first place that our applications didn't run. So let's not forget about that. So we needed to take a trip and do the cave of debugging. So we go in this cave and it really wasn't such a bad cave because we found some friends in there and our friends had some good ideas about what might be going wrong. I had some ideas too. And what I ultimately found is that when I added a local DNS cache, the cluster that for first didn't come up at all, all of a sudden came up. And so who was lurking in the darkness? It was the DNS fish. Yes, you get out of here. You nobody wants to hear about you anymore. Yet you somehow are always around. So I said, okay, great. Let's run our application again. Maybe we'll we'll see it run this time. So just to give you a sense of what I'm seeing, what you're looking at here are application times for a fairly good problem size for our application. And you're looking at time as a function of the cluster size. And so what we're doing is something called strong scaling, where you hold the problem size constant and you give it more resources. And what you'd expect to see is that it gets faster. And to some extent, we do see that. So we do see that up to size 32, but then at size 64, like, oh, Something happens and that something suggests that the cost of communication offsets any potential benefit to adding more resources. Hmm. And also, I just want to point out that these times are not very good. So, oh, uh, like, <laughs> it's still slow. Thankfully, Antonio swam out of the collaborator sub and he was like, I can help V. You see, there's all these things that you aren't considering from the base image to how you're building MPI, networking flags, and importantly, the instance type. So we did many more experiments. And by the way, this is over many months. And we found, we ran into new errors, like, yes. Uh, so both of us were like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> but I had this insight and many developers have this insight when you don't understand something, you need to measure things. We needed to measure the network and understand what was going on with our application. And because I had just done this work with job set, this was at the forefront of my mind. I was like, hey, job set, can you come down here? And job set was like, I don't know. It's kind of creepy down there. <laughs> but job set gives us this flexibility to model not just our applications, but also tools for performance analysis. And the insight that I have specific I had specifically was that so many of our applications, along with actually machine learning applications, have this launcher and workers design. So I could actually implement everything from proxy apps to networking and storage or IO tools using this common design. So this turned into what the metrics operator, yes, he's absolutely adorable. With the metrics operator, you create something called a metric set. And the metric set is going to allow us to look at that networking, which we thought was the culprit, specifically using something called the OSU benchmarks. So we needed to dive deeper, so first, change of wardrobe and we again went down 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 still going down into the abyss of expectations which is a very dangerous place to be might i add and so my first expectation was that hpc applications need low latency we always have these beautiful infiniband fabrics why would they not need it so let's go back to this idea of tight coupling what does that mean i want to talk more about mpi the message passing interface so MPI, if we look again at this launcher worker design, HPC is going to be using a tightly coupled design. So we may start with thinking of the concept of nodes. So here we have nodes, there's a launch node and worker nodes. But in HPC, because we need to run complex scientific simulations, we actually care about the relevant unit of a process. So instead of looking at nodes here, what you're looking at are 14 CPU that, to that do the work, and they are going to be communicating using the message passing interface, which is called an interface because it's more like a standard and there's different implementations of it. So I need to stress that because these processes are on different nodes, that often means that we're gonna have communication of processes from different nodes. And that's why the networking is so important. So there's different patterns of communication that we define, and we're gonna talk about two kind of families today. Those are point to point and collective calls. So point to point communication may be a send and receive, and this is exactly what it sounds like. You have one CPU that is sending a packet of data to another one. Hello, it's me, I've got a packet of data that you might want to receive. And then hopefully the other CPU is gonna send a message back or other. Otherwise, the first CPU is going to be making music videos in black and white that are really sad and 
you know how that goes. <laughs> so the second pattern is called collective. And these are communications between collections or groups of processes. So here you see an example of MPI sum. This is a little like MapReduce where you start with a bunch of numbers and then they reduce down to one sum. Now the most common collective call is called MPI all reduce. This is gonna add something called MPI bcast, which is going to broadcast that data out to more than one CPU. And we can actually look at these calls for collective and point to point across HPC applications. And as I mentioned, MPI all reduce is the most popular collective call. And then send and receive are the most popular point to point functions. So I must stress that because of these communication patterns, without a low latency network that abs absolutely cannot be performant. So the OSU benchmarks are going to allow us to measure these through two things, OSU all reduce for collective, OSU latency for point to point. And we're gonna be using the metrics operator. Here's what that looks like to create a metric set. And the goal of the metrics operator is just really make it stupid easy to run these HPC apps and applications powered by job set. Already, so here we're looking at OSU latency. This is a point-to-point -point benchmark. On the cloud, we see latency in microseconds in log scale as a function of the packet size. And you're probably looking at this like, well, how do I know if this is any good? Well, we can compare it to HPC, which is orders of magnitude better between 10 and 20 times, depending on where you are in this graph. And so I looked at this and, <laughs> and my little abyss of, abyss of expectations, and I was like, oh, it's the latency. I knew it. That's the culprit. But I also had another malformed expectation, wink, wink. I thought that I knew that my application would run better on HPC. I assumed that it would run better, but I hadn't actually run it yet. Oops. And at this time, there was also sort of a blessing in disguise, which sucked at the time. But <laughs> the blessing was that I did not have quota. So the instance type that I wanted to use, I didn't have quota for. So I had to fall back to a different instance type that I hadn't really tested as much. And I was shocked. So remember we talked about strong scaling. The strong scaling looked beautiful. We saw that as we increased the MKI ranks, this time went down. And although this wasn't like the best that I'd ever seen, I was like in shock because this was the result that I had wanted to see way back in May, many months earlier. And so I'm sitting in my abyss of expectations with a nice stewing pot of confusion like what just happened? This didn't even work before. And of course, my confusion very quickly turned into delusion. I was like, it's OK. I'm still going to try on HPC, and I'm sure it will be better. Again, shook. <laughs> so what you're looking at here, we added in HPC, the cloud. It has the red boxes around it. And what we actually see is that the cloud times were faster for our MPI application, except for the largest size where one of our HPC clusters was slightly faster. And so what that suggests is there's still some issue with communication between nodes when we get to those larger sizes. Hmm, what could be that cost? What's going on here? And we can actually then look at our all reduced benchmark because that is a proxy for communication. So I know this looks like someone like sneezed on the slide, but let me try to explain what you're looking at here. You're still looking at average latency in microseconds and log scale as the function of the packet size. There's two groups here, the top group, this is cloud, and those little dots in between are actually an increase in cluster size. So the, the dot on the bottom is the smallest, the one on the top is the largest. And so what you see is that as you add more nodes that need to talk together, the time goes up a lot. Now HPC is the second group and it's much lower. Again, orders of magnitude, and this is a cluster that has a Finiband fabric. And look at the difference in units. I just want to point out, these are sort of in the tens versus over 100. So there is a very large difference. So we do suspect that network is still becoming an issue at these larger sizes. So how could we further look at this? Well, we brought in our metrics operator again that also can run a tool called the HPC Toolkit because we wanted to verify that the time spent in all reduce was actually going up. And I was running out of cloud credit, so I only could run this on three sizes. But we, what we saw is that as the size increased, indeed, the time in all reduce, the time spent communicating between nodes was increasing. And this, in a way, did validate what we thought. Communication is definitely the bottleneck at larger sizes. So I can say this comically now, 
But I woke up the next morning after, after all of this, after these results and being surprised, and I was overwhelmed. There were so many variables to think about. The story was not clear and logical, and there were still so many things I wanted to test, and it, it totally went against my expectation. This is why it's so dangerous to be in this abyss, and it felt really bad. But this is also why it's so important to have a supportive team, because my team <laughs> came down and they were like, Hey V, it's a little dark down here. I know you're having some kind of party or something, but maybe it's time to come back up. And so we left the cave of debugging and we had learned so much. And actually the first point was almost joyful. We were like, wow, we were actually wrong about always having the need for the lowest of latency. The latency doesn't have to be super low. It just has to be good enough. And in fact, our application problem is CPU bound at lower ranks and network latency at higher ranks. And the reason it works so well on cloud is because the cloud has really awesome, shiny new CPU. So at this point, we could kind of return to the service. And this is where we are today. These are the things we still do not understand. We do not understand why this particular instance type did not work originally. We also need to better look at our expectations. What expectations are sort of lore do all of us carry that come from our community that might just be entirely wrong? And then application design, this is the coolest bit. How can we take our applications and kind of put, understand the patterns that they need to map them to the right environments? And so to kind of summarize the story, we started in this new space that we didn't understand. We found a design strategy to map between spaces. This was job set. And then we could figure out a means to easily measure and run things. This was the metrics operator that ran everything from proxy apps to benchmarks. And operators in Kubernetes are so cool. They are like developer Legos for building things. Highly recommend. In parallel, no pun intended, we also need to understand the application patterns and needs so that we can really best optimize the environment for them. And you know what? These are really complex, hard problems. This is not just the work that one team can do, not even one lab. We need to bring in collaborators from, you know, not other labs, industry, academic, all over the place. And we have to work together on this to solve these hard problems. And, you know, this is just the start. We are hoping to like build a little bridge to get across HPC to Cloudland, but Really what we want to move toward is this future where we can have the best of both worlds, this converged computing. And you know what? There are a ton of adventures ahead and we hope that you join us. I can promise that I won't be out somewhere on adventure, but you know what? You are invited to come to KubeCon, back to you. All right, you can see why I went first. It's hard, hard to match Vanessa's energy. Um, so just one last uh, piece here on uh, future work for job set. Um, I mentioned um, the placement policy a little bit um, uh, about like our plans to have a proper API with better um, you know, configurability. And the other thing is, as you might know, if you've ever used Pod Affinity, it's not the most performant you know, constraint that you could have on, on, job, on, on pods. So we're thinking about approaches, how we can accelerate it. Um, one solution we have is like having a leader forward pattern, like only one pod of each job would have, like for example, index zero, you can use a webhook to do that, would have the Pod Affinity and Anti Affinity constraints. Once that pod schedules, all the po other pods on, of that job Basically, we would have a validating webhook that blocks creating them until its leader is scheduled. Once the leader is scheduled, we inject node affinity to follow the leader pod on, into the same topology. For example, if it's a pod slice, it would go to the same slice ID. Um, so that makes it basically much faster. So we split the scheduling into two pieces. One is the 200 pod that represent the leaders of the 200 uh, jobs that we create. Those are gonna schedule a bit slowly but the rest is gonna be um, fast. Um, and for failure policy as well, we have some ideas. Um, right now we recreate all the jobs when a failure happened, which again, it's too, it's a big hammer, right? Like it's too expensive. Uh, we are thinking about ways how we can do in-place pod restarts in a reasonable way. 
Um, and the main issue here is how we broadcast to all the pods that they should restart. Um, so some ideas is like maybe we can have a config map that all the pods mount and they receive that broadcast with a sidecar that basically uh, tries to make it more composable once it receives this restart and it goes and does like a kill five uh, to the main, main, main uh, container. Um, and that's pretty much it. So this is our repo. Uh, it's uh, sponsored by the batch working group. Uh, and if you have any questions, please uh, uh, reach, reach out to us on the batch working group Slack channel or uh, uh, email. And uh, also special uh, acknowledgement to Daniel who helped uh, implement our job set and uh, couldn't be here today. Uh, thank you.